everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to another episode of In the Studio. I'm Lynn Weaver. Our topic is 3D printing. Gosh, that sounds very interesting. My guests are Russell Neches. He is a microbiologist doing his PhD at the Genome Center here at UC Davis. And Stephen Lucero, and he is a mechanical engineer at UC Davis in the Department of Biomedical Engineer and facility manager of the TEAM Prototyping Lab. And Correct. TEAM is an acronym for Translating Engineering Advances to Medicine. That's right. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank I'm you. delighted to have you here. And I'm looking forward to be enlightened because I know nothing about 3D printing, except that it has a very nice sound to it. <laughs> um, so um, the question, the obvious questions is, and I'm going to take, have two takes on this. What is 3D printing? And then I'm going to ask Stephen. And Stephen, listen before, don't prepare what you're going to say to contradict <laughs> your friend. Um, I don't know, okay. he won't steal my thunder. Oh dear. <laughs> Go ahead, okay. Uh, what is 3D printing? Well, um, uh, there are a variety of ways of manufacturing um, three-dimensional objects. Um, traditionally, what you would do is you would start with a block of stuff like plastic or aluminum or wood. Or Lego. That's actually you closer to 3D Legos printing. Usually. Yeah. No, I mean. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, so you start with a block of stuff, right? And then you use some sort of tool, like say, for example, like a rotating bit. End right? mill, as it's End called. End mill, yes, right. right. End and, and mill, did you say? End mill. So in traditional manufacturing, that's one of the tools. Oh, yes, yes, is, is the, yes, of course. He's being... I do a little of both. He's, he's yeah. being the pedantic machinist yeah. here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the scientist who... I use silly right. terms for things. So, uh, so you start out with a block of stuff, and uh, uh, you, you you chew away the parts of it that you don't want there. Uh, I think um, I think it was Michelangelo who said, you know, that the, the sculpture is already in the in the marble, in and the you marble. just have to remove Extract the bits it. that you yes. don't need. Yes. Um, and so this is called subtractive manufacturing. Subtracting, and this is unidimensional, uni or is it multidimensional? This stuff. So, so like you literally would start with like a block of aluminum and then okay. subtract, right? So okay. that's that's traditional, traditional that's uh, manufacturing. manufacturing. That's how yes. things have been done for a long time. Now. Since the mm. industrial revolution, I sure. suppose. And yes. before that, even. Yes. So. Yeah, I mean, okay. if you think of like so that was sculpture. then, and yeah. now we're looking at. Now, yeah, so, 3D printing. So there's, so if you imagine, you know, if you're sculpting in marble, you would remove the bits that you don't want. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were sculpting in clay, you would take the, the clay and kind of like stick it together like little pieces of clay mm -hmm. until you get like a larger clay body. That's the thing that you mm -hmm. want. That's called I additive, additive that. manufacturing. Yeah. Um, and so what has happened with uh, with um, 3D, 3D printing. printers, right, is that. Um, 3D printers allow you to do additive manufacturing with computer control. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting the little bits of material together, right, yourself with your fingers, right, you have a, the computer controlling a, a robotic gantry to like stick the material where you want it to go. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some important uh, differences in the topological constraints that mm -hmm. like what basically what is possible to manufacture with these two different techniques. Um, like, for example, if you imagine you had a sphere and you wanted to make a hollow sphere with something inside of it that was not attached to anything, would rattle around. Like a good example would be, uh, of like a similar sort of part would be, you know, those little whistles that you use for like, uh, like track and field? Mm -hmm. There's a little bead inside that rattles yes. around, right? Yes. And somehow you have to get the bead in there, mm -hmm. right? And usually what that means is you have to manufacture two separate parts. You put the bead in and then you close it up. Yes. Right? Uh, with 3D printing, um, the, because of the unique way that it assembles the part, if you imagine you're putting together, sticking mm -hmm. together all the mm -hmm. little bits, you can manufacture it with the bead already in there, like mm -hmm. already captured inside. So that's what I mean by a topological constraint. It's a, it's a why constraint? So so if you were if you were going to manufacture traditionally, yes. right, you're going to start by removing all the bits that you don't want. Yeah. It would be like you, you wouldn't have a way of getting the bead inside the, the, oh, the, I see. the, the, the cavity. Yes. Right. Whereas with additive manufacturing, you have fewer topological constraints. Okay. So far, so good. I can follow you. What about <laughs> you, Stephen? So that's, that's kind of the fundamentals of, 
of how 3D printing works. You, you start with a solid model, typically something that you've designed within um, computer-aided design or CAD mm -hmm, software. Mm -hmm. And the software will essentially take that model mm -hmm. and slice it up into small layers. Mm, interesting. And really the fundamental role of the printer is actually to take those layers and deposit them. Mm. So it's in principle pretty simple process. Um, it's just a matter of, of depositing layers until you end up with a 3D object. So this is interesting. Is it true that the 3D printing technology is not uh, very novel uh, that has been here for quite a while? When it's, I say maybe absolutely. more than two years. Yeah, <laughs> early 80s. Early um, 80s. Is actually when and it what was it was used invented. for then? Mostly prototyping. Oh, uh, prototyping for architectures. For, for, for uh, architecture. That would be one example. Yeah. A, oh, okay. A lot of aerospace prototyping also, mm. uh, because the the original three D printers they, they used materials that were quite expensive. Yes. Um, and so, you know, it would be less expensive than, you know, machining apart from you know titanium or something like yes. that. So yes. So if you were making like a, you know, like the screw for a submarine drive. Right. My goodness, yes. You know, um, you might, and you wanted to test like its hydrodynamics and things mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. you're like, well, okay, maybe we should 3D print this before we actually like start cutting titanium. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so well, that's that fascinating. But of course, to me, what is really, and to our audience uh, now, what is really wonderful from what I read is the applications that you can yield from this technology. And for example, I'll come back to you, but uh, Russell, um, you told me the story, uh, a very, you know, the story of how you used it for your PhD mm -hmm. uh, dissertation. And um, <clears throat> can you tell us in just a few words what you did? Yeah. What attracted um, you to the, uh, to so, the 3D printer? So I, I kind of got interested in this for kind of a very funny reason. Um, I'm a microbiologist, and one of the things that we, you know, that's happened recently in microbiology is we've been scaling up the um, the number of experiments that we do in the course of a project. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, for so the the project that I'm interested in, you know, I potentially had to handle tens of thousands of samples. Uh, that, that was sort of the worst case scenario. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it didn't Molecules go. Molecules or samples um, of these, these are like pieces? Th these things. are like different, like different, uh, like actually, you know, samples from different organisms. Oh, oh, oh I see, right? yes. And Little then, bits and pieces of, yeah, of so, something. So <laughs> you could think of each, each one as like a totally separate experiment. Right? Yeah. And I would have like, you know, potentially 10,000 of them. Oh, like, oh my gosh. Gives me a headache. Or yeah, yeah, it gave, gave me a headache yeah. when, I was, when I realized, when I penciled yeah. out how, like what the worst case scenario was. So I was like, oh my gosh, I have to go tell my committee that like, like the worst case scenario is 10,000, you know, yeah. DNA preps right. and 10,000 sequencing samples. And then what samples. happened? And so, so I, so I wanted to make sure that when I went and did my qualifying exam, that I could at least tell them that plausibly there was a way I could do this mm -hmm. um, automatically, mm -hmm. right? And so I looked, you know, broke down the process, and I said, well, okay, there's, uh, there are all these different steps that are basically you treat every experiment the same. But there's this one step that was really, really simple where you had to treat each experiment separately, where and it was very, you know, basically like you, you, you get the DNA from the sample, you extract mm -hmm. the DNA. And you get kind of like a random concentration. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the reactions need a uniform concentration. So mm -hmm. there's a step where you take the random concentration, you add a little bit of water, and then you bring it to the right concentration, and then you proceed with the rest of the chemistry. Okay. Right? And so it turned out that the, the rate limiting step for, for scaling this to 10,000 reactions was just adding the right amount of water mm -hmm. to each experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, okay, so I'll, I'll get a robot and have the robot dispense the water. Okay. That'll be great. <laughs> so, so I went shopping for robots, and mm -hmm. um, most of the liquid handling robots were really expensive and mm -hmm. really not very good. And, mm -hmm. and the software was really annoying to work with. So I said, I'll, 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 I'll buy an inexpensive 3D printer, and I'll just remove the part that, th that remove the nozzle, right? And just put a little thing that just squirts water. That's fantastic. <laughs> and that's how you succeeded. Now, um, going. I Actually, it turned out I didn't need to do that. You so. didn't need to do that, so it was even easier. Yeah. So, Stephen, uh, what, uh, what, how do you see, uh, are you seeing these 3D printers 
uh, help uh, biomedical science. Sure. Uh, yeah, you are the facility uh, manager for the prototyping lab, That's so right. you can do a lot of prototyping. I'm sorry, I'm hurrying you a little bit because we have limited time, but hopefully I can entice the audience to go to your website, Sure. And uh, which is BME dot UC Davis dot edu slash team, right? Slash team. So yes. traditionally, we, we talked about how you make things traditionally. Um, the problem with that method is that it takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort to design cutting pads and things like that. Versus with 3D printing, we essentially feed it what we want, and within a matter of hours, we have our design. Um, so more than anything, it's expedited mm -hmm. everything. Um, and we can also achieve far more complicated geometry as well. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, this is a collaboration that we have mm -hmm. with the Vet Med Maybe Teaching Hospital. you can hospital. hold it up a little bit. Like yeah. so? Yeah. Okay. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him well. What is it? What is it? <laughs> so, so this is a pretty interesting object. This is a 3D printed dog skull. Oh, um, my goodness. And this is derived from um, CT imaging data. So this is a yeah. live patient. Yeah. And this is clearly not a real skull. Right. This is based on imaging data. Um, and if we look, I don't know if the camera will be able to pick this up, but if we look right here, you can see that this particular skull has a cancerous growth mm -hmm. represented here. Mm -hmm. And so what the surgeon will do is actually inspect this model and do their surgical pre-planning prior to their operation. Which is wonderful. Yes, it yes. makes their life significantly easier. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They have everything planned out, thought mm -hmm. out, Mm -hmm. If they need to design any implants, mm -hmm. um, that can be done beforehand, before mm -hmm. the animal is even mm -hmm. under the knife. Oh, that's fantastic. Right. Do you have another example you want to share with us? Um, well, scattered about well, the little cushion here, we yeah. have just a number I'm, of different I'm curious pieces. about the shoe. <laughs> ah, yeah. So um, <laughs> okay. th this, was, this was actually a... Can you hold it up, um, Sure. This is, this is actually a design that, uh, a prototype that my, my friend uh, Mary, Mary Huang uh, made her for well, we for were working, herself. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> we, we were I, we were collaborating on a on a, on a project that became yeah. you know a, a, a small company that she's launching. Yes. Um, uh, so um, the reason why she designed this this isn't my design I'm just showing mm -hmm. her cool design. Mm -hmm. So um, is we wanted to see if we could make a shoe out of a flexible material. So this is made out of uh, rubber. Um, yeah, it's basically mm -hmm. a, plas mm -hmm. a, a rubberized or plasticized rubber. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so this is a, uh, you know, it's it's actually wearable. It, you know, if you, mm -hmm. if, I think if you're mm -hmm. a size size eight, this will fit you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me see. Size eight. <laughs> um, well, it, it's interesting. There is one missing, and then I, I I'd love you to give us uh, that uh, a little bit of a demo really quickly. But there's one thing that I'm afraid comes to mind, uh, and I'm trying to understand. So now the data that you feed in this computer in sorry in the uh, that you give to the printer to print mm -hmm. is actually a multi-dimensional file that's right multi-dimensional file that so you need to have an application that supports that can generate, that, these can generate that that's okay correct. and this cad being one of them right correct. Yeah, CAD okay. is kind of a general term for that. Process. Okay, yeah, for that. So, um, so that's all you need basically, and then basically. the imagination and the choice of material is up to the scientist or up to the engineer. Right, to, and that's kind of an ever expanding process yes. as well. I have to say that uh, I, the lab, uh, the team lab, is. Um, um, serves many departments in the at the university Across the right? entire university that's yes right. so you must be very very busy and <laughs> how does it work the the medical uh, school or the genome center or sure. the my biology department they come to you and right. what do they so say it can it can come from a couple of different ways so yeah. i can have someone who has never done anything like this before like me correct yes and you have this faint concept of of what you want to achieve yes and I can take you through design to creation, okay? mm -hmm. um, to a tangible object. Um, or we can simply make use of the printers. So let's say you already have a design, you have the skills to generate right. the model. And then you're already just printing. And we will yes. give it to you. Okay. And the choice of material is also uh, very um, 
There's a lot of uh, quite Correct. ranging. For example, give me an example of material. Plastic, we saw the plastic. Rigid rubber. plastics, flexible rubber-like materials. This, um, is, this is actually wood. That's wood. That's wood. <laughs> yeah, that, that that a wood composite. What yeah. about if paper, if you want to make an origami type thing? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> and of course, like, you don't have to 3D print something to make paper, so. <laughs> I know. Wood is a pretty close analog yeah. to paper, yeah. right? Well, um, I'm afraid we have just a little time left. So, Russell, take it away, your demo. My demo? Well, um... Taken away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a 3D printer. Yep. It doesn't look very, um, you yeah. know, high tech. It yeah. looks more like a, this particular a crate, one. Yeah, that so, particular one. So we probably so. don't have time to actually print something, unfortunately, no. but... Um, but turn yeah, it can, on first, so, so, we can, so we can... Yeah, so it's running now. Um, uh, and I can just... I'll point oh, it out is the, not running already. Yeah, so I can point out the different parts of it. Um, essentially, the main part, so there's this, there's a platform where the, where the part actually gets built. Yes. Uh, if you, if you can, if you look closely on the, on the build platform, there's, uh, there's actually a failed print already stuck to it. Uh, we ran out of, uh, plastic in the middle of this print, so it's just <laughs> sitting there. So uh, it's jammed. Well, it's just out. It's empty. Okay. Um, <laughs> So the plastic sits on this uh, on a spool in the back like this, yeah. um, and it comes as these uh, sort of wire-like filaments. Yes. Um, and what are you going to do with that? And so the first thing that happens is there's uh, there's a little motor with a little you know a little gear in it that um, basically grabs onto the plastic, shreds it, and shove well it just shoves it up through this tube oh, okay. here, and then down into this little nozzle, and there's mm -hmm. a little little uh, aluminum block here that heats up to about 220 degrees Celsius, which is enough to melt the plastic. And it just squirts the plastic out of the nozzle. So you shouldn't right. put your hand in there. Yeah, I've burned myself a few yes, times correct. on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't tell eh and S. No, 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 I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, uh, so basically the, Now you know, it's the, off now and yeah, you're just, doing a... I just switched yeah. it off so I can move the motors around. Yeah. So the, the computer basically pushes the nozzle around you know, to, uh, you know, basically like, as I said, put the plastic where you want it to go. Um, and as, basically, so it'll build up a layer, and then as you, as you um, continue building the part, the... Um, stage drops the, down. Yeah, the stage drops mm -hmm. down so that you can build, you know, layer on top of layer. That's fantastic. Layer. Fundamentally, it's a glorified hot glue gun, is what it really oh, is. Oh, okay. Yep. This particular system. Oh, that particular one. Right. Well, gentlemen, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry we have to leave it there because we're out of time, but I hope our audience uh, will uh, be um, enticed to learn much more. And again, go to the website or go and see these two gentlemen. I'm sure that they have, in their ample spare time, they'll be able to answer all so your much. questions. So um, Actually, it is quite you've, fun. Been, you've been watching in the studio. If you'd like to stream this episode, you can go to our website, dctv.davismedia.org, and we'll also be on YouTube. And while you're there, you can check out some of our other programs. We have fabulous guests and very interesting topics. And I would also like to take a second to thank our sound engineer, Sam, and our technical crew, <laughs> Matthew, uh, Calvin, and Kevin. Thank you all for watching, and from all of us here, see you next time.